Well, good morning, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Bob Worgen, the newly installed president of the American Academy of Family Physicians as of about 20 hours ago. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome my colleagues from the Family Medicine for America's Health Board, and I'm thrilled they've chosen this assembly to launch the site for their new campaign, Health is Primary. This event and the build-up to it has sparked so much anticipation among our family physicians across the country and our members of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Walking around D.C. and seeing all these great ads uh, that really talk about the critical importance of primary care has been a vivid reminder to all of us as family medicine doctors that uh, what is this is really an extraordinary time for healthcare delivery in our country. And we have so much opportunity, not just to change the system, but to use this momentum uh, in a way that will actually help patients get healthy and stay healthy. And we can do that as fa the family physicians of this country. Now I'm going to be turning the podium over to my good friend and colleague, uh, the chairman of the Family Medicine for America's Health, Dr. Glenn Stream. And Dr. Stream is a family physician uh, from Rancho Mirage, California, and past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He is a Washington State native, uh, and Dr. Stream attended the University of uh, Washington and received his undergraduate degree in microbiology. He earned his medical degree, again, from uh, the University of Washington Medical School or School of Medicine, and then went on to complete his family medicine residency at the Swedish Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program, also in Seattle. He also has recently completed a biomedical informatics degree at the Oregon Health Science University. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Glenn Stream. Thanks for that introduction, Bob. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today for the official launch of Health is Primary. I'm thrilled to be chairing Family Medicine for America's Health and to have the honor of introducing our new campaign. We're very excited today to have with us two of the most prominent and thoughtful experts in the area of health care. They played very different roles in driving and advocating for reform, but both have had enormous impact on shaping health care in this country. Before I go into the details of our campaign, I'd like to ask them both to share their thoughts on primary care and its role in health care. I will start with Dr. Don Berwick. Dr. Berwick is one of the nation's leading advocates for high quality health care. He served as administrator for the Center uh, for Medicare and Medicare, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services under President Obama. For 22 years prior to that, he was the founding CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement a not-for-profit organization dedicated to improving healthcare quality around the world. A pediatrician by background, he's also served on the faculties of the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Berwick has authored more than 160 articles on healthcare policy and healthcare quality improvement. His books include Promising Healthcare, How We Can Rescue Healthcare by Improving It, Curing Healthcare, and new rules, regulation, markets, and the quality of American health care. Our second speaker will be Dr. T. Sorry, Mr. T. R. Reed. I knew I was going to. I knew I was going to uh, make him a doctor. T. R. Reed has become one of the nation's best-known reporters through books and articles, his documentary films, his reporting for the Washington Post, and his commentaries on NPR's Morning Edition. T. R. Reed has written nine books in English and three in Japanese, uh, and translated one book from Japanese. His 2009 book, The Healing of America, became a national bestseller. PBS Frontline made two documentaries, Sick Around the World and India, A Second Opinion, following Reed as he did reporting for that book. T. R. Reed has also made documentary films for uh, the National Geographic Television, PBS, and the A&E Network. His film, U.S. Healthcare, The Good News, premiered on the National PBS Network in 2012. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Don Borwick. Don, please. Thanks very much, Glenn and Bob, and uh, thank you all for the chance to spend a few minutes with you celebrating this extremely important launch. I'm, I feel very privileged to be here. I wanted to share a few thoughts about the um, 
intellectual background for what uh, Family Medicine for America's Health is undertaking here um, and uh, reflect a bit on why I believe it's so important, especially right now. Um, the foundational uh, framework for a lot of what uh, this campaign is endeavoring to accomplish is the so-called triple aim. Uh, I feel very connected to the triple aim. I described it in an article in Health Affairs uh, back in the mid-2000s, and I wanted to give you a few minutes of background on the, on the, on the source of that idea, where it came from, uh, why it's important, and I think it is, and why it's e e equally important that the primary care forces of the country be embracing this as a framework for our goals in American health care. Uh, the term triple aim is not mine by invention. It actually was created in 2006 by a colleague of mine, Dr. John Whittington. John is a primary care, as, as a family physician in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he was working as a researcher, uh, a faculty member of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the organization that I uh, founded and ran, uh, with my other uh, close colleague there, Tom Nolan, who is a statistician and a, probably the intellectual engine of IHI in many ways. John and Tom were meeting and came to me with a piece of paper in which uh, Whittington and Nolan had written down this concept of uh, a framework for goals. They were trying to clarify what ought to be the core, the central, the foundational aims for a healthcare system in any country, but certainly in the United States. Uh, the reason they were doing that has to do with the theory of quality itself. The modern approaches to the concept of improvement, the concept of quality, are driven by the work of many scholars in the, in the mid part of the, the, the 20th century, W. Edwards Deming, Joseph Duran, Ishikawa, Mizuno, and others, who were trying to come up with a rationale for the organization of systems of complex production. And there are many, many components to the modern views of how improvement occurs, all founded on systems theory which has been the heart of the work of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the organization that I was leading. But no idea is more fundamental to the engine behind modern improvement than this, and that is that if you want to survive as an organization, as a worker, as a workforce, if you want to thrive in an economy, meet needs. If what you do meets the needs of someone who needs your help, you're likely to be able to survive and thrive and be proud of your work. If what you do isn't meeting need, then you will not survive and thrive and uh, survive and, in, in your work and, and will have trouble finding meaning in your work. So the concept of attention to need is core to the success of any globally competitive company today and to the modern views of quality in both the for-profit and not-for-profit world. Um, they were trying, Nolan and Whittington were trying to come up with a framework that would, that would uh, label the needs that we really are intending to address or ought to be intending to address in the healthcare enterprise worldwide. And they thought that these three basic aims, which together constitute a system, they're not in competition with each other, they're three convergent aims, define the social need that healthcare ought to be trying to address in order to survive as an enterprise, as well as to meet its ethical obligations. The triple aim is three aims, three goals, which together unify purpose. They are these, better health, better care, and lower cost. The one we're familiar with in the enterprise of healthcare for a century is, is, better, is, is better care. People get sick, they have a heart attack, they break their arm, they come in for a checkup, and we're, we try to organize a system of, of, uh, of work that addresses that set of needs. We do okay, but could do a lot better. And that, that enterprise was well described and given a charter in 2001 by the Institute of Medicine chartering report Crossing the Quality Chasm. Crossing the Quality Chasm is about one aim, better care. And it defined better care in six dimensions, all qualities dimensional. And those dimensions you well know, if you, probably in the organizations you work with, they are safety, don't hurt people, effectiveness, align care with science, uh, patient-centeredness, begin to turn control over to the people you, you help, um, uh, timeliness, avoid delays, efficiency, avoid waste in the production system, and equity, close racial and social economic gaps for, uh, in, health, in healthcare. So that's safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. A big agenda. That's the agenda of better care. What Whittington and Nolan said was that there really were two other aims that needed to be wedded to the, to the, to the agenda of better care. They were better health, because as you know, 
from your own clinical training, and if you're epidemiologist, you know it even more, that the leverage on health status, which is what we ought to be trying to achieve with respect to, to the healthcare enterprise, isn't very strong when you're using only healthcare to address it. Uh, healthcare, epidemiologically, has about 20% of the impact on health uh, uh, that, 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 that's variable in, in our lives. Uh, if you take all of our health and sort it into causes of differences in health, 50% are genetic, and the other 50% of the other 50%, 10% is health care, 40% is everything else that we do with our nutrition or exercise patterns. And if we're going to work on health, we've got to get out of the health care box. We've got to broaden our attention to what we're trying to accomplish. That was the second goal, better health. The third goal is lower per capita cost. This reflects the concept that the money healthcare takes from production, from other, source, other enterprises of production in both the public and the private sector is, is opportunity lost. And that it is a duty in healthcare whenever possible to restore resources to other enterprises that add to well-being in communities. Um, the, uh, that combination of goals, better care, better health, and lower cost, is, is the triple aim. Uh, the consequences on the cost side are, are vast, and I want to take a minute to describe how big. This has recently been digested by the, um, the Commonwealth Fund in a brilliant single slide, which I hope you have seen. Uh, David Squire and David Blumenthal at Commonwealth asked a very simple question. The United States is the most expensive country in the world with respect to its costs in health care. T.R. Reid's been the the Thomas Paine of that, uh, <laughs> that exploration. Um, they asked the question, what if, starting in 1970, America had been not number one in cost, but number two? Number two is Switzerland for that period of time. What if the trajectory of expenditure in health care had followed the Swiss trajectory instead of the American trajectory? What would have happened in terms of available resources? And the answer is $15.5 trillion dollars would have been available for other social enterprises instead of health care. They, they, they try to describe what $15.5 trillion will buy. One of the things it will buy is you could cover the state of South Carolina in solar panels, which they're not proposing, but it's an idea, <laughs> and meet, uh, dub, meet, more, meet uh, double the needs of America for, for energy. Now, I saw the effect of this, um, what I call confiscation of social opportunity by health care up close and personal in the past 18 months when I ran for governor in Massachusetts. Uh, I was unsuccessful. The election was a month ago, the primary election. But I got to see the effect of health care's growing costs on other enterprises. And without boring you with the details, let me just tell you what the story in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, in the state budget, the public budget, parks and recreation have gone down in support 25 percent in the past decade. Local aid's down 40 percent. Higher education's down 30 percent. I could recite line after line. They're all down 20, 30, 40 percent, except for one line item in the state budget. That's health care. It's up 59 percent in that same decade. There's a transfer of resources going from health care, from other social sectors to health care. The triple aim, better care, better health, and lower cost, is a system of social goals which Whittington and Nolan and I argued health care should embrace. Now, that sounds important because it is important. What does that have to do with you, with the American Academy of Family Practice, with the associated organizations as part of this, uh, part of the Family Medicine for American Health program? Everything. My father was a general practitioner. We didn't have family medicine in those days, but he practiced in a small Connecticut town. He did everything. He took his own x-rays. He delivered babies. He did surgery. He, he was the comprehensive doctor, uh, a wonderful doctor, I think, a great diagnostician and a great role model. Um, what I know today is that if my father were suddenly to, to come back and see what's happening in health care, he would be mightily confused. He would not recognize his own work in relationship to such a systemic issue of goals, nor would he be particularly comfortable at all with the consequences of this in respect to his own accountabilities, the measurements, the certifications, the, the scrutiny that he'd be under. He would be angry. He would be in denial. He would be circling the wagons. But the problem is that with, with, with that much resource going out of other sectors into health care, with the America's health being as far behind as we are, 42nd in the world in our, in our survival rates, something is going to happen. 
And the question we're going to face in this country, I think, in the next decade with respect to this economic and health status uh, issue, the triple aim issue, is who will change it, because it isn't going to stay the same. And there are only two possibilities, in my view. One is what I'll call outside-in change. The forces of concern, those who are paying the bills, those who are regulating health care, those who are concerned about health and about cost, will lay hands on the system more and more to get it to be different. They'll use reward and punishment. They'll change compensation systems. They'll pit in new metrics. They will be very blunt tools, but something is going to be acting on the health care system outside in. I don't think that's the preferred pathway. The better pathway, the elusive one, is inside out. Those who are entrusted with the production of health care in America now have an opportunity to embrace a bigger set of goals, better care, better health, and lower cost. And the window is open now. It isn't going to stay open. But the best solution for America's achievement of the triple aim, which is the social need, is clinician-led, patient-engaged, inside-out progress. We saw it in the Choosing Wisely campaign, uh, the multi-stakeholder effort among specialties to come together under the, uh, with the encouragement of the American uh, Board of Internal Medicine Foundation to identify overuse, an area of potential cost savings. But now the window's wider because the enterprise is so crucial. And this stepping up you're doing now in this campaign, this effort to finally embrace better care, better health, and lower cost is uh, exactly what's needed. The alternative is less desirable. Uh, my guidance, five quick thoughts for you. Uh, as this campaign gets underway, as an unsolicited advisor, I would say these. First, pace matters. There's a horse race on right now. The, the competition for resources in an American economy that's stressed is dramatic. And there's no room for leisure. And so if the Family Medicine for America's Health program is going to proceed, if uh, health is primary is going to be real, it's got to work at pace. You've given yourselves a five-year window. Bravo. Make sure you take that window. Second is the issue of authenticity. Hand-waving isn't going to be enough. The results are going to have to be there, and the per capita costs are going to have to change in your community, in your state, and in the nation if we're going to actually be delivered, uh, delivering on a social need. The third is, I think, localization matters. I don't think we're going to see a vast national policy agenda to support this. I think what will happen is if this campaign is going to work, it's going to happen community by community, which is what excites me about the outreach that you're engaged in here. The fourth is that non-physician professions will matter. And I urge the, the, the complete embrace of advanced practice nursing, of pharmacy, of healthcare management, professions far away from medicine itself in order to make this uh, collegial effort of great scale to achieve the triple aim among professions. And finally, make sure, as I know you intend to, that the patients and families and communities are deeply involved. When patient voice is strong, you know better than any other branch of our, of our health care endeavor that, that things get better. Bravo to Family Medicine for taking the leadership here. The need is there. The opportunity is there. The window's open. And you'll have me rooting for you uh, from now on. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts, Dr. Berwick. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, I keep calling him Doctor. Yeah. Did you sleep at a Holiday Inn Express or something, Tom? Uh, Tom, please come forward. Thank you. Hi, everybody. No, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm a consumer of American health care. And as a consumer of American health care, I'm, I'm just delighted with this ambitious national program to remind Americans of the importance of primary care. So I'm really pleased to be here, but it's a little dawning for me to be here because let's be frank, I have no right to be on the same platform with national leaders like Don Berwick and Glenn Stream. I, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an economist, this is, uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I really only have two credentials for being here. One is uh, I went around the world to look at healthcare systems that work and figure out what we can learn. And my second credential is I'm from Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and that's relevant. I'm going to make the case that that's relevant. You know, like people from, from Nebraska, from every state, we, we're pretty proud of our state in Colorado. We're sure we have the best skiing and snowboarding in the country. We think we have one of the most beautiful states in the country. In more ways than one, we're the highest state in the country. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what's more relevant is, according to several measures, the NIH says we're the healthiest state in the country. Uh, Colorado has the lowest rate of obesity, both adult and uh, juvenile. And as a result, we have very low rates of the chronic diseases that stem from uh, obesity. Uh, guess what? We're a low-cost state for health care. The Dartmouth Institute, which does these comparative studies, says all our major counties are providing health care at costs below the national average. Um, now, I know there's some debate about this statistic, but uh, our medical school, our one medical school, University of Colorado Medical School, is turning out, a, a, among the graduates, about 45 percent have been going into primary care in recent years, and that's a pretty high number for American medical schools to turn that many out. And as a result, if you look at our core of doctors in Colorado, we have a higher proportion of family care doctors as opposed to specialists in most states. So that's kind of a jumble of different statistics, right? But guess what? They all go together. Uh, because it's clearly a fact, and you can see this around the world and around our country, states or countries that focus on primary care have better population health and lower cost. This is just an ironclad rule of health care. Primary care provides better health at lower cost. These go together in uh, everywhere. And one of the reasons all the other countries like us, advanced high-tech free market democracies, one of the reasons they are able to provide very good uh, health care for everybody at half our cost is because they put more focus, they put more value on primary care than we do. When I went around the world, health ministers, economists would tell me that they thought the right ratio of primary care docs to specialists, uh, they, they thought about 50 to 70 percent of doctors, two out of three, should be primary care. That, that seemed about right to them. And of course, in the United States, we're backwards. We're at, what are we at, 32 percent, 30, with well, less than one in three doctors as a primary care doctor. So one of the reasons these other countries are doing better at lower cost than we are is because of they, they just have more primary care in their system. Now, how do you get that? How do you get that? Well, if the population and the health care system puts some value on primary care, you get more primary care. Like, take Great Britain. Sixty-four percent of the doctors in Britain are primary care docs. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but traditionally in the U.K., the surgeon in the hospital is called Mr. But the family doc on the high street, he's the doctor. He's called doctor because they value this. And get this, in Britain, a family physician with a, they call it a surgery, a surgery on the high street, a family physician, the average family physician in Britain earns twice as much as a cardiac surgeon. Now, you do that, you get a lot of, of primary care. It works. Um, and, you know, as I said, I got into health policy fairly late, and when I was studying up on health policy, I found all these reports and studies saying, well, you know, an emphasis on primary care will produce better health at lower cost. But I didn't understand the mechanism. How does that happen? And then I figured that out in my own life. Here's what happened. A couple of years ago, on a Wednesday morning in January, I woke up and my leg was purple. My right calf was just covered with these huge, ugly, grotesque, purple blotches. It's terrifying what the heck is going on here. And all that day, my leg got more purple. It got worse. The next morning when I woke up, much more of me was purple. My daughter saw it and was terrified. You know, she gee, well, you know, it's grotesque. You've you got to go to the doctor. You know, you need an MRI. You've got to get a CAT scan for this. And uh, I didn't even know what kind of doctor to go to. Where do you go if you have a grotesquely purple leg? I, <clears throat> dermatologist, endocrinologist, is it cancer? You know, I just didn't know. The only doctor I really know was my family doctor, my family physician. Um, Grady Holder is a family physician, a member of this organization in Denver. He knows me. He sees me, you know, he's a doctor who sees me 
not as a sick organ, not as a broken joint, but as a whole person. He knows me. And I went in to see Dr. Holder. He looked at my purple leg for about five seconds, said, you're fine. You're fine. What do you mean fine? Look at this. It's disgusting. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, well, you're a snowboarder, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, and we had a big powder dump on Tuesday. I bet you went up there with your board. I did, yeah. And he said, and I bet you took a fall. Yeah, I took a pretty hard fall. And he said, yeah, so you broke a blood vessel, and that's why your leg is purple. It's going to heal itself, and about a week from now, your leg will be fine if it's not come on back. So he gave me the diagnosis, and no treatment necessary, reassurance. And this cost, cost me about $18 copay. It cost my insurance company about 80 bucks. But what if I'd gone to the hospital? It would have been seven times that. If I'd had an MRI in Denver, that would have been $1,000. Uh, I got the treatment, the assurance I needed from a primary care doctor and saved the system hundreds of dollars. I think American Healthcare ought to pay me better, pay Grady Holder back for this. <laughs> this, is, this is the benefit you get. Um, now, another thing, reason that we need to emphasize primary care, and I'm glad we have this program, is uh, you know, this is debatable, but uh, I concluded that America really doesn't have a doctor shortage. We have more doctors per capita than some other countries. We have fewer doctors per capita than France or Australia, some other countries. Roughly, you know, we end up about the middle of that. But where we do have a shortage is in rural America. For some reason, all these youngsters coming out of med school want to work in Washington or New York or San Francisco. You know, it's hard to get them to Kit Carson, Colorado. And um, the people who are providing health care throughout rural Colorado, including Milford, Nebraska, are family physicians, are primary care physicians. And uh, a few years ago, I did a story for the Washington Post about this shortage of docs in rural America. And I went up to uh, in eastern Wyoming, it's a pretty wide open, sparse country. I went to Wheatland, Wyoming to see this family physician. He'd been practicing there for 30 some years. And I uh, called him, I said, hey, could I talk to you about your practice? I'll take you to dinner. And we went to the Wheatland Diner and he, he said, you know, we got, we got to get out of here fairly fast. I got something to do tonight. And, you know, we were getting along at dinner. So I said, well, what are you doing tonight? And, he said, oh, you know, it's a big high school basketball game, Wheatland versus Chugwater High. This is a very important game. We got, I got to be there. I said, I'll go with you. So we went into the high school gym in Wheatland, Wyoming, and I said to, uh, to this doctor, which side are we cheering for? And he said, you know, I don't care. I delivered every player and every cheerleader on both schools. Uh, this is the role of... Uh, of primary care. And, and the beauty, I think, of this, this new campaign, national campaign, is that, as Don said, it's inside out. It's coming from doctors. And one of the things I found when I went around this country looking at health care is all over the country there are physicians who aren't waiting for Washington to fix things. They're taking their own steps. They're working on their own. And here we have the American Academy of uh, Family Physicians have designed a program uh, to, to get more focus on primary care, which, as I say, did I mention this, will lead to better population health at lower cost. It does everywhere. When I made that movie, U.S. Healthcare, the good news, we went from Seattle to Cleveland to Allentown to Grand Junction, all over the place, there are local doctors finding ways to provide good care for their population at, um, at low cost because these incentives can, these initiatives can come on a local level. It's probably better than waiting for Washington. Washington, D.C. can't do anything at the moment. So uh, it's better that doctors do this on their own. And here's what I'd like to see come out of this program. I'd like to see more emphasis on primary care because it does provide better care, uh, good health at lower cost. But, you know, the real need in our country, the most important need from my point of view, is uh, we need to provide health care for everybody. Uh, we're the, of all the rich democracies in the world, there's only one that doesn't provide health care for everybody, and that's the world's richest country, the United States. Uh, I think this is a, it's a moral imperative. A decent, humane, wealthy democracy ought to provide health care for everybody. And at our current cost levels, it's going to be very hard to do. 
We need to provide better population health at lower cost. Primary care is going to be a key element of that, so that's why I welcome this new initiative. Thank you, everybody. Thank you both so much for your thoughtful remarks. Another round of applause for Dr. Don Work and, and snowboarder patient uh, T.R. Reed. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to introduce the board uh, of Family Medicine for America's Health, a newly established coalition of the eight primary care family medicine organizations in the United States. So uh, I'm, again, I'm Glenn Stream. I practice family medicine at the Eisenhower Medical Center in Rancho Mirage, California, and I represent the American Academy of Family Physicians on this board. Uh, as I say your name, would you please stand? Dr. Tom Campbell represents the Association of Departments of Family Medicine. Dr. Campbell currently chairs the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. Dr. Jennifer DeVoe represents the North American Primary Care Research Group. Dr. DeVoe is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the Oregon Health and Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Jerry Cruz re represents the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine. Dr. Cruz is the executive associate dean at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine and C CEO of SIU Healthcare. Dr. Paul Martin represents the American College of Osteopathic Family Physicians. Dr. Martin is in private practice with the Providence Medical Group, an 80-member physician-owned medical group in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Bob Phillips represents the American Board of Family Medicine. Dr. Phillips currently practices in a community-based residency program in Fairfax, Virginia, and holds faculty appointments at the Georgetown University, uh, the George Washington University, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Mike Tuggy represents the Association of Family Medicine Residency Directors. Dr. Tuggy serves as a clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He is the director of the Swedish Family Medicine Residency Program and medical director of the Swedish Family Medicine First Hill Campus Clinic in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Jane Wyda represents the American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation. Dr. Wyda is on the faculty at the Reading Hospital Family Medicine uh, residency in West Reading, Pennsylvania, where she serves as medical director of the Family Health Care Clinic. To ensure a broad perspective on our board, we've invited four additional members. Dr. Jen Brule from rural Plainview, Kansas, is a full-time practicing family physician who offers a full scope of services from delivering babies through hospital and emergency room care. Dr. Lauren Hughes, currently a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow at the University of Michigan, represents early career family physicians. Vince Keenan, chapter executive from Illinois, represents the AAFP chapters, of which there are 54 around the country. And Lauren Birchfield Kennedy represents the patient advocate perspective as director of health policy for the National Partnership for Women and Families here in Washington, D.C. This group, Family Medicine for America's Health, has come together with one mission, and that is to improve health in America. As everyone knows, our country is facing a health crisis. We have the most expensive health care system in the world, yet we rank almost last amongst industrialized countries in patient health. The good news is we believe our country is at a tipping point. A number of major shifts, including the Affordable Care Act, the establishment of the patient-centered medical home, and improvements in technology have changed the landscape, and we believe these represent an opportunity to truly transform and improve our nation's health. It's time to put the health back in health care. We believe the solution to many, if not all, of our health care problems can be found in primary care. We are so convinced of it, we plan to spend the next three years making the case to patients, payers, and policymakers that a strong primary care system will allow us to deliver on the promise of the triple aim, better health, better care, and lower cost. The evidence for primary care is strong and speaks for itself. We know that access to primary care can help us live longer, healthier lives. In areas of the country where there are more primary care providers per population, death rates for cancer, heart disease, and stroke are lower, and patients are less likely to be hospitalized. 
An increase of one primary care physician per 100,000 people can decrease costly and unnecessary care. Outpatient visits declined by 5%. Inpatient admissions declined by 5.5%. ER visits declined by 10.9%. And surgeries declined by 7.2%. Evidence also shows that primary care is associated with more equitable distribution of health in populations. U.S. adults who have a primary care physician have 33% lower health care costs. Medicare spender, spending is lower for states that have more primary care physicians, and yet these states have more effective, higher quality care. Health, quality, and cost. That is the triple aim we must achieve, and we believe primary care can best deliver it. So what does America look like when health is primary? We believe it looks a lot like family medicine, and we want to ensure that whether your primary care is a family doctor or not, you can live in a place where health is primary, a place where doctors and patients work together in true partnership. Doctors have long-term relationships with their patients and see them as a whole person. Technology supports and fosters the connection, uh, the connection between patients and doctors. Everyone has access to a medical home. All of their needs can be met in a coordinated medical neighborhood that, uh, that provides additional care when needed. Prevention and health promotion are as important as treating disease. Doctors work with community leaders to address individual and population health. Health disparities are reduced by increasing access to primary care, and financial incentives align with good care and better health outcomes. The Health is Primary cam campaign will work to deliver on the promise of, trip of primary care. So how do we do this? First, we plan to hit the road. We were inspired by T.R. Reid and his brilliant PBS piece, Health Care, the Good News, and we plan to travel the country making stops uh, in a variety of cities to showcase examples of where and how true primary care works. Our goal is to make these stops to bring together local stakeholders, employers, policymakers, and patients to look at community level interventions working to enhance and expand primary care and improve health. We know there will be different approaches in different regions, but the goal is the same, better health at sustainable cost. We know there are many places where health is primary in America. We want to learn from them and bring them to scale. Our tour will kick off early next year. Keep an eye on our website, healthisprimary.org, to learn about the cities we are visiting and what we are learning from them. Second, we will engage patients. Patients are the untapped resource in the effort to reform our health care system. We know that patients have enormous control over their own health, and we want to work with them to prevent disease, manage chronic illness in this country. We will, be, we will include working with them to increase collaboration between physicians and patients, providing them with actionable information about how to improve their health through exercise, nutrition, prevention, and good chronic illness management. We'll be running quarterly mini campaigns about a range of health issues throughout the course of our campaign. Our goal is to arm patients with information that will help them understand what primary care is and how to get the most from their primary care medical home. Third, we'll usher in a new era of health technology. Technology has changed virtually every aspect of our lives, but for many reasons, healthcare is not kept up. We will work uh, closely with technology companies and policymakers to determine which tools are most effective for building the, uh, the connection between patients and doctors and identify ways to accelerate their use. Technology can bring care directly to our patients to make your smartphone the new house call. As we run the external campaign, we'll also be working with other primary care groups, payers, and policymakers to enhance and modernize the primary care system in this country. We'll be forming multi uh, multidisciplinary teams to expand access to the patient-centered medical home, improve the use of technology and practice efficiency in patient care, recruit the best and brightest to primary care specialties, and shift to a comprehensive payment model that rewards volume, value over volume. So I'd like to share with you a video that's uh, part of the kickoff of our campaign. So if we could show the video. When we were growing up, medicine meant our family doctor. When we were sick, had a broken bone or got hurt, that's where we went. 
The technology was simpler then, but our doctors took care of us and helped us stay healthy. Things changed over time. We changed, and healthcare started to change too. Scientific advancements made medicines and treatment better, but the healthcare system got more complicated. We started spending a lot more money, but all that investment didn't make people healthier. Healthcare started to feel a little disjointed and impersonal. Now everybody is talking about reform and the system. It's gotten pretty loud, but nobody's really talking about health, good health. Isn't that really what we all want? Our country has the best doctors, the best hospitals, and the most innovative scientists. Shouldn't we be healthy? Somewhere we lost our way. We forgot what matters. We need to embrace the values that make people healthy, like a long-term relationship with a trusted doctor, someone who knows us, our family, and our risk factors, someone we can connect with when we need them, who uses the latest technology, someone who can help us stay healthy, and when we're sick, help us get the most from the healthcare system, someone who can see the big picture and the small one. That's what the best healthcare should be, a system based on primary care that can make our advanced medical system work for real people. We know how to get there, and going there now can give us a system that works for everyone and makes us healthy again. Now is the time. Together, let's make America a place where health is primary. So I want to, again want to thank uh, Don Berwick and T.R. Reed for framing the situation and the challenge that lies ahead for our effort. This is an ambitious effort. It won't happen overnight, and we can't do it alone. We invite our colleagues in healthcare, payers, employers, patients, and the broader medical community to join us in this cause. Let's make America a place where health is primary. Thank you. So well, we have a few minutes, uh, uh, and if anyone has questions, I will do my best to field them and respond uh, about the efforts planned in our, in our campaign. Sure. So uh, I, one of the beauties of family medicine is our goal for patient engagement is extraordinarily broad, across the age spectrum, across the sites where care is delivered, and geographically around the country, highlighting especially rural and underserved uh, areas, as, uh, as T.R. Reid mentioned. Uh, they're certainly one of the initiatives behind uh, us considering uh, and, and deciding to succeed, uh, proceed with this campaign is the issue of the newly insured folks that have been outside of the health care system. Uh, Actually, many of our members have been take, our, our colleagues have been taking care of those folks for years. It's just now we'll actually be able to to give them better care. Often we would see them at at no cost, but not be able to access the other necessary aspects of the healthcare system. So we have some catching up to do in the health of those folks that are newly insured. Uh, but really, the the scope is is uh, is the full spectrum of of people in our country if they don't already have a source of primary care, if they don't have a medical home. Uh, as far as a policy agenda, I'll tell you a lot of that's still to be determined. But if you look at it broadly, our health care system, uh, as, as both uh, Dr. Berwick and T.R. Reid mentioned, is upside down as far as the, the, the composition of our physician workforce. We don't have enough primary care physicians to deliver uh, on this promise uh, because we don't have the foundation of primary care we need. Our policy agenda will align with changing that. How do we get more medical students into, in, uh, into medical school who are interested in primary care? How do we maintain that interest? How do we help them deal with their educational debt and their medical training? Uh, and how do we deliver for them a practice lifestyle uh, and, uh, and professional reward uh, that, is, uh, that is satisfying and attractive to them? So it's across that full spectrum. Uh, each of those steps has a policy agenda that would be built around that. There was another question, uh, ma'am. How are you going to exceed the community uh, where you're going to showcase on the, on the road? 
Sure. Um, I, I think I, I had a chance to have lunch with uh, uh, Mr. Reed yesterday, but I didn't have a chance to ask him how they pick their cities. But the idea is to tell positive stories. You know, how can we highlight examples of where things are working well? Where have there been good community efforts aligning the medical community uh, with the, the uh, uh, community leaders and employers and payers to deliver? Um, his documentary highlighted uh, you know, a well-known example in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, which is really a, a, you know, a beacon for the country to look at as far as one model where that could be done. But we would be looking for those types of stories. Um, you know, our colleagues practice across all the 50 states and four territories, and, and we'll be looking to them to highlight stories to us. Uh, and so we, uh, we have not chosen those cities yet, and that's why the teaser to stay tuned uh, on the website. But those are the characteristics we're looking at. It's, it's places where we can learn from and where we can extend that message of success to communities that are struggling with the health uh, uh, in their community and how primary care can help deliver on that. Other questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, Chris Manzolini with Medical Economics. Yeah. Um, my question is, when it comes to the triple aim, you know, when, when I hear lowering costs, I hear taking money out of other interest pockets. How do you, how do you kind of uh, take on that challenge? Sure. Well, if you look at most payers, they uh, would pay about 6% of their global outward payment for medical service, about 6% of that goes to primary care, and the rest of it goes to hospital care, imaging, medication, so many things. Uh, I, 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 my board and these eight organizations are absolutely convinced that solid primary care uh, investment can save costs on the back end. It doesn't need to be paying people less. We just need to do less of those services that don't contribute to people's health, that are services that are late salvage type of, uh, of efforts in the medical system that could have been avoided with, with preventive services or good chronic illness management. We need to prevent those uh, uh, on the back end. Um, uh, Dr. Berwick highlighted the Choosing Wisely campaign. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our colleagues are very much embracing that idea of, of having those tools to engage patients in choosing services, both prevention, wellness, and treatments, and, and, and helping them understand when things aren't in their best interest, uh, and by avoiding those unnecessary costs that don't contribute to health, you know, we then are a, a very positive force in globally saving costs in the system. Other questions? You can't let me off that easy, you really can't. <laughs> Sir. How about things like retail clinics, uh, even the app now, you can go on your phone and talk to a doctor somewhere. I've seen you know, AAFC did a great concerns about trying to take some care. Sure. Sure. So in the generation of this campaign over the last year, there was a very focused effort on understanding what's the current environment. You know, what are the trends that we're dealing with? Obviously, the specialty of family medicine, more broadly primary care, operates in this ecosystem of, of health care. And as, as Dr. Berwick so eloquently described, the overall global economy of our, of our country. So there's a bunch of disruptive innovations happening. Uh, retail health clinics and apps and other technology things are, are very much uh, um, uh, on our radar screen. We had a great presentation at our opening ceremony yesterday by Dr. Eric Topol uh, with a glimpse of what's on his radar screen, which seems to look further out than mine, about what the technologies are that are, that are coming down the pike. But if, if we are going to be effective and we are committed to being effective in delivering primary care, we need to respond to those challenges. So for retail health clinics, uh, we seek to have those be part of that medical neighborhood I referenced uh, so that if, if someone needs minor illness care, it can't happen in separate silos that don't build a relationship with their medical home, that don't address uh, anything other than perhaps that one episodic health care need. For technology, we want to be engaged. We have a very uh, significant technology focus in our campaign. We want to be part of a voice that helps patients and doctors both evaluate apps, evaluate other technologies to identify those that actually are beneficial in, in providing that connection between patient and doctor, uh, between their medical home, that are meaningful improving their health rather than just looking slick and cool on my 
new iPhone 6, which I really do love. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it can't just be about what looks cool or whatever is the latest release. It, it, at the end of the day, if it doesn't improve health, even if it only costs you 99 cents, you didn't get your money's worth. So uh, we, we will have a very significant technology focus. Can I mention our... Uh, Thing. And so we'll be participating on a panel at the Consumer Electronics Show in, uh, uh, in Las Vegas in early uh, January, highlighting how uh, uh, we want to step up to, to reach across to that community of people doing the innovative technology things so that we can be a, a partner and collaborator with them in, uh, in uh, identifying and promoting those things that create that connection and do improve health. Other questions? Yes, in the back. So really one of the areas of focus, uh, uh, and again, I think, again, credit to Dr. Berwick for identifying this, we need metrics around our campaign. And the metric around cost is we have to globally reduce cost per capita. Uh, and uh, we as family physicians actually if you look at the you know, average panel of patients you take care of and what their per capita cost is for a year of care, that's a multi-million dollar budget. And we need to manage it uh, more effectively and we will need to uh, partner with uh, payers that are capturing this data, ideally through a multi-payer sort of data source as opposed to individual silos of healthcare payer information to really global under globally understand and work with our patients. This patient engagement piece uh, is, is really critical. And, uh, you know, I really appreciated the framing of it as the redirecting of resources from schools and parks and, uh, you know, other societal needs. If, if we can get that message to patients and collaborate with them uh, and understanding that reducing health care costs is not intended to withhold care from them that contributes to their health, but really is to be wise stewards, uh, not just of health care dollars, but of, of societal resources. That's very much our commitment. Yeah. So I'm. Yeah. So I, I have that opportunity tomorrow night. I'm going to talk to a large group of students, and and I uh, I believe, and the students that I interact with, they embrace uh, a multitude of, of of things about the healthcare system. They are uh, positively inclined towards this team model of care that we envision in the patient-centered medical home, where physicians work with nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants educators, dietitians, physical therapists, behavioral health folks, that whole cadre of, of necessary uh, and knowledgeable professionals that can deliver care. They, they embrace that team model. Um, and they really are focused on, uh, on social determinants of health uh, around uh, reducing health care disparities. And uh, as we've uh, outlined in our campaign, we're very much aligned with that. And I think that that is going to be attractive to them. On a practical standpoint, we have to get through the issues about um, their educational debt and, uh, and, and payment for services once they're in practice. We need payment that adequately recognizes and compensates the care delivered in that medical home model. Sir. Well, I, I, I what I would like to say is it depends a little bit on them, too. I mean, we uh, very much have this uh, consumer engagement, patient engagement, community engagement strategy. Uh, as I said, we can't do this alone. I don't think healthcare can do it on its own. I think we need the, uh, uh, the community and uh, payer and employer folks to step up. So my hope is they're going to be living in a community where health is primary and they're going to see these benefits. Keisha. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? What should we be telling new physicians who are entering primary care, maybe just going out of residency, about mm -hmm. uh, what they should be expected to provide for their patients? Yeah. So a, a lot of that uh, is going to depend on what sort of practice environment they were subject to in their residency training program. If it wasn't a medical home, they really need to look at that. Uh, what we're asking is that the entire 
not just family medicine, but the primary care community look at the current state of the patient-centered medical home model and how can we further extend and evolve that. Uh, I, I, there's, there's no system that's perfect, uh, and the medical home has gone a long way, I think, towards uh, uh, improving our health care delivery in primary care, uh, but it can go further, and uh, we, need, we need to uh, further that uh, extension to the medical neighborhood, being uh, consultants and pharmacists and school nurses and all those things. So, I, you know, their, their investment as new family physicians is a career that is 30 and 40 years ahead of them, so I hope they will be an active voice uh, it's why we have an early career family physician on our board. All right. One last chance, like an auctioneer would say, going, going, going. I got one quick question. Please. Um, what, what can your campaign do to, to help family doctors and primary care doctors and stuff get off the treadmill in terms of you know, feeling overwhelmed about this, this daily life, dealing with the HR, dealing with all the challenges? What, um, I guess, what, what way can that be addressed with, with doctors that are out there? Sure. So I, I would have sort of two components of an answer to that. One is the recognition that, that somebody understands the challenges they're facing and that we are stepping up as a specialty um, to, to address those concerns. The other is in this city tour, I, uh, being able to highlight areas where they've had success, not just improving care uh, and uh, 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 improving health and reducing cost, but what's often called the quadruple aim, which is improving the professional satisfaction of practicing physicians. And that's critically important to this effort. It isn't just attracting new people to the specialty, it's maintaining the professional satisfaction of those folks mid and late career so that they want to continue uh, practicing and they remain a resource for their community and for their patients rather than get to the burnout phase that we so often hear about. So uh, we want to bring them those two messages. Great. All right. Again, thank you all for being here, uh, for everyone's input and questions. And again, a special thanks uh, uh, to Dr. Berwick and T.R. Reed. Thank you very much.